What's up, what's up, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Vanguard. I uh, got a great episode today, an extra spicy edition of the Vanguard for all you fine comrades tuning in on this Thursday afternoon. It's a great, beautiful day. Really looking forward to today's show. How you doing, Zach? Doing really well, doing really well. Got a nice walk in with the pooch uh, this morning, so that was always good. Nice way to start the day, get the blood flowing, drink a cup of coffee, and now I'm ready to talk shit on the internet like we do. That is, in fact, what we do. Got some hot tea here, ready to spill it. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, thanks for tuning in, everyone, to the Vanguard. As I said today, it's going to be an awesome live stream. We have a shit ton of topics to discuss today, so make sure to stick around for the entirety of the live stream. Lots of interesting and important news, as well as a good, solid, healthy dose of lefty infighting and gossip, as always. Um, but before we get started, you guys know the drill. We do like to shout out our patron community at the beginning and end of all of our live streams. So that's what this is. Huge shout out to you guys supporting the show on patreon.com slash the Vanguard channel. That link is going to be able to be found in the description of this video as, as always. Uh, so please consider you know, becoming a patron, contributing to the Vanguard. Um, if you enjoy the content we create, uh, we would not be able to do the show without the patrons and their support. Um, so again, that link is in the description. If you'd like a spot of your own on our shout out screen, um, then hit that up. It's a great way to support the show, support independent leftist media. Obviously, we're being crushed by the algorithm and YouTube. We've probably already been demonetized for today. So again, really, really helps out. Would not be able to do the show without you guys. A uh, huge shout out sincerely from the bottom of our hearts. But as I said, we got a lot of shit to talk about today, man. We got a lot of good stuff. We've been taking a couple days off, but we're back with a full stream folder ready to go. Lots of shit, as I said. So again, hit that like button if you're just tuning in. Helps promote the stream in the algorithm. Um, and subscribe if you're not already. If you're watching the Vanguard and you're not subscribed to us, then what the hell? A large amount of you, so many of you, we found out the other day. You just watch. You just lurk. You're like me on Reddit. You're just a lurker. You never upvote, downvote, comment. No, you just exist on there. But anyway, uh, yeah, we've got a bunch of good shit to talk about. Um, I guess uh, we could briefly talk about the fact that uh, Kentonji Bra uh, Jack Brown Jackson, uh, new Supreme Court justice, can officially uh, confirmed. And, uh, you know, despite uh, some, you know, the fact that she might not be as radically um, you know, le radically leftist as us, you know, we're just normal people. But even though she might be a little more neoliberal for our taste, I think if anything, uh, the the onslaught against her kind of only made her appear more base. The Republicans really tried to uh, smear her as being some like woke critical race theory, America hating, um, you know, uh, you know, George Bush bashing you know, crazy person. And in reality, every single time they brought something like that up, I was like, oh, oh, she called George Bush a war criminal. Like, hey, maybe she does have her head screwed on a little more right than I thought we were going to get from the Biden administration. So obviously she won't be perfect. But um, as far as I can tell, looking at her record, uh, this was about as good as we could have done from a, a Joe Biden pick for uh, um, a Supreme Court justice. But Gavin, did you have anything that you wanted to add about that? Yeah, obviously, Katanji Brown Jackson, as you said, is far from perfect, but there are some aspects of her record which make her slightly more based, as you said, than you know what we would have expected from Joe Biden. So I guess it's a small W. Uh, obviously, it's not going to change the makeup of the court, so you know it doesn't really matter. Um, but still, you know, worth talking about. Big news of the day: Supreme Court justice confirmed. Definitely a win for the Biden administration. Although I think we all knew this was going to happen uh, anyway. Yeah, that that is one thing that happened. Yeah, and um, you know, so it'll be interesting. Obviously, uh, it wouldn't have it won't have any real meaningful impact, as you mentioned, Gavin, unless Joe Biden decided to grow a pair of balls and stack the court, which he should have done uh, after the Republicans uh, basically robbed the Democratic Party, like uh, you know, out of a, a Supreme Court seat as well. You know, he has every right to try and go in there and play hardball. That's what I would have been pushing for somebody like Bernie Sanders to do to kind of you know, rebalance the court a little bit as it stands. The Republicans are, you know, uh, basically uh, going to control uh, the the courts for, you know, the, the next generation, you know, um, unless we get lucky and something happens to, um, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? Clarence uh, Thomas. Clarence Thomas, who was in the hospital yeah. recently. Yeah, yeah, 100 percent correct. Um, do you want to segue into talking a little bit about the TYT story for today? Yeah. All right, let's get into this. This was something that's a little bit, amusing to me at least 
Uh, let's go back in time a bit to 2020. You guys might remember 2020, uh, you know, a bit of an important year in modern American history. Um, obviously, the lockdown was going on, the coronavirus pandemic rearing its ugly head. And of course, grifters like Jank Uger were out here desperately trying to figure out how they're going to keep, you know, extracting money from their audience, continue to monetize their uh, commentary in a time like that when. Uh, you know, media was in upheaval. They were having to do the show from home. Uh, money was, you know, clearly a little bit short over at the Young Turks. Uh, Young Turks. Uh, again, this was in 2020. And let's take a look, listen to some of this video that Jenk Uger released about a book that he was writing and apparently still is writing. Uh, but we're going to dig into that and, and all that uh, and more. So let's take a look at this video. I don't know if how many of you guys are familiar with this because it doesn't get talked about much, if at all, on TYT these days. I don't think Jink has hardly brought this book up since um, this initial announcement back in 2020. Uh, but we got some more details about the future of this uh, book and, and more. So let's take a look at this video and then I'll give you some of those details. But this is an interesting story and I think really illustrates beyond a shadow of a doubt just what a scam TYT actually is. Uh, but yeah, let's watch do one thing um and my whole life uh, people have been telling me to do one thing um and they keep saying this especially since i've been on the young turks every friend i have every family member and a lot of you guys will you for god's sake do this thing jake what is it write a book fine you win the name of the book is justice is coming <laughs> of course subtitle how progressives are going to take over the country and America is going to love it. Such a stupid Bro, title. Can we pause it? Yeah. I was just gonna say, can we pause it for a second? I just that first how far is it? That's 33 seconds into this clip that he's announcing. I just want to point out to everybody listening how Trumpian is the rhetoric that he's using right now. How and his delivery and all that shit. Let me just if we instead of early, oh, we're not gonna have it in angry jank voice. If if we do it in Donald Trump voice, there's one thing people have been telling me to do all my life, guys. Everybody I know, my friends, my family, my cousins, my nephews, my grandpa, uncle, everybody I meet, they all tell me this one thing. They tell me this one thing I should do. They tell me you'd be great at it. Oh, it would be so amazing if you did this, they say. And then I say, Oh, maybe one day I'll do this thing. And what thing is that? That thing is, is I will write the greatest book that has ever been written. Justice is coming. I will write about how we are bringing justice and everybody is going to love it. I'm just saying, very Trump. Oh, 100% so Trumpy. And also just, what a dumb title for the book. I actually used to have a friend named Justice spelled with a <laughs> spelled with a U instead of an I. But anyway, when I hear that title, all I can picture is him ejaculating, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, for other reasons that you talk about with your therapist in private, Gavin, we're going to move on. Anyway, let's keep going. <laughs> okay. So here, I got a hard copy with me here, too. Uh, is it already written? Uh, nope. Uh <laughs> also, what the fuck? Who literally has their book printed, a hard copy version of their book printed, when it doesn't even actually exist? He literally just said the book's not complete yet, but is holding up a copy of the book. So imagine being so narcissistic that you're like two or three chapters into writing your book and you're like, we got to have it. We got to have a hard copy version made just so I can fucking look at it and hold it uh, a physical copy. It's so it's so dumb. I, I genuinely don't understand how or why he has a hard copy version of a book that doesn't actually exist yet. Uh, maybe he just made a, a book cover and put it on a book that does actually exist. Um, but you know, pretty, pretty interesting. And by the way, you know, I don't have a problem with people writing books as long as the books actually exist. I don't have a problem with someone selling your book as long as you actually have a book to sell. Uh, but again, this was in 2020. And as we're about to show you guys in a second here, this book's still a long way off from from being a real a real fucking thing. Um, before we get into the, the rest of this video and some more details, thank you, Christina, for the nine ninety nine. Really appreciate that donation. Great show. Thanks for calling out these TYT frauds. Jake is so insufferable. He is indeed. He he truly is. Um, and it's not even that I would necessarily have a an issue with his uh, kind of boisterous personality. Um, if he wasn't 
constantly scamming his audience and extracting money from them and um, being a union buster. It's crazy. So, yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, this is the exact kind of leftist par or parody of, uh, you know, the whole right wing peddling of, uh, you know, supplements and all this kind of stuff is like books that, you know, are, uh, you know, kind of like or TYT emojis or whatever stuff that's in the pipeline. Right. Um, this is how uh, they get along. But the one thing that I have to just point out here is you mentioned this was in 2020, back when TIT was molding about how they needed extra donations to survive during this rigorous time, yada, yada, yada. And I have to give credit to Jimmy Dore really quick because he did savagely take them down for this. He was like, how does it get more fucking expensive to sit in front of a camera and yap? I do it. Cost me the same amount of fucking money as it cost me when there wasn't a virus eating shit. You know what it did cost everybody else? Their fucking jobs, Jank. So how are you asking people to fork over their fucking hard-earned dollars now more than ever when they're unemployed? You want some of their unemployed mint money, Jank? Are you that fucking desperate for capital, you fucking senseless money-grubbing whore? Like, that's ridiculous, right? So I just want to point out, um, you know, the kind of the hypocrisy, right? Out of any industry, uh, the media was the, it was the easiest to fucking set it up, especially because it wasn't like they had massive fucking... Um, you know, expenses getting set up, you know, Jenk just would sit in front of front of his freaking iPhone or laptop computer from home and, uh, you know, be able to call in. That's how you get guests to call in all these kinds of things. It's not like, you know, they had to do some massive lift where, you know, they were running a restaurant or a fucking clothing store or something and it all shut down. So uh, I don't know. It all just reads as extra scammy, but also extra greedy, too. It's like, as you mentioned, Gavin, the worst time ever. Uh, to fucking try and impose this on people. And then we're however many years later and it still hasn't come to fruition. And if you can believe it, it's about to get even more shameless. His ta He's really like a goddamn like used car salesman. I swear to God, that's what Jank is in like a different in a different uh, timeline. And if the multiverse is real, there's one out there where Jank is the best goddamn used car salesman in the fucking planet. Um, but thank you, JFLO Productions for the 499. Really appreciate that. A few weeks ago, you had the audacity to call yourselves Island Boys. How dare you? It's about time you become island men. Hell yeah, bro. Yep, we're going to be moving to the Florida Keys, and you'll never hear from us again when we're the island men. No, I'm kidding. Um, but thank you for that super chat. What was the band that made the Who Let the Dogs Out? Wasn't it like Island Men or something? Uh, Congo Men? I think it was Congo Men or something like that. Baja Men. Baja men sorry. Uh, yeah, Baja Men. Throwback. Yeah, dude, you know, I, I had that mind blowing moment when I realized that like who let the dogs out is like about ugly women coming out at the club and you're just like, oh, no, it is. I, I saw a tweet about that the other day and it was just like, you'll have a, a glass shattering moment when you realize that who let the dogs out is about ugly women coming out at the club. And then I'm thinking about how there were Disney Channel remixes of this song uh, made with children. And you're like, oh, my God, it is about fucking ugly women coming out at the club. Who let the dogs out? Like, oh, no. But anyway, we had that moment. I guess you're right. Now that you say that, I guess that is I guess that is the implication. That's hilarious. But anyway, we're a little bit off topic now. Again, this is about to get even more goddamn shameless. Um, just witness the, the mental gymnastics that he wants you to go through in order to get you to buy this non-existent book. Um, let's let's keep watching. <laughs> Some of it is written, but I'm working on the rest. So what you can do now, it's not out yet. You can pre-order. So um if you go to justiceiscomingbook.com, justiceiscomingbook.com, you can start pre-ordering on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all the other outlets. Eventually, obviously, we'll have it on our sh at our shop as well. Uh, and by the way, the pre-orders uh, make a big difference because um, then based on that, Amazon and the others will order more books. And uh, one pitch. This motherfucker isn't even telling you not to buy his book on Amazon. What a fuck. Cheer, guys. So for, first, I'll, I'll tell you what's in the book, and then I'll tell you why it's potentially important to buy. Okay, easy for me to say. So um, what's going to be in the book is um, what we've gone through so far, the battles that we've fought, and I got some stories for you guys. And some stories I haven't even said on air yet, and that'll be in the book. Uh, but but also uh, how we are going to take over the country with great detail. And, and I'm going to prove that uh, the country's already progressive. I've already written that chapter. You're going to love that chapter. It is indisputable proof that the overwhelming majority of Americans are already progressive. They just don't know it. Unfortunately, the number one reason for that is the mainstream media. Uh, they keep telling you that centrist corporate Democrats and Republicans are the center of the country. That is not 
true. We have absolute evidence uh, that it isn't true. And so when progressives do take over the country, why is America going to love it? Well, there's also chapters on that. But as you guys know, we're not actually uh, going to just only work for uh, progressives or Democrats. Are we also going to give health care to Republicans? Of course. Okay. Are we going to look out for senior citizens who are Republicans? Of course. Are we going to increase the wages of Republicans as well? Of course. So when people see our agenda uh, and you can get past the mainstream media filter, it makes all the difference. And so there will be definitive cases on each of our policy positions and, and, and show you a, a pathway for how we can win on all of these things. And, and so uh, the, the pitch part of it is if, if a progressive book goes to number one in the New York Times bestseller list, and yes, that is definitely possible, and you guys can make that a reality, guess what? Then all the publishers are going to want to have 100 progressive books. Folks in media don't believe it. By the way, just what a fucking capitalist, by the way. Like the only way progressivism will ever win is if you get my book to number one on the New York Times bestseller list and it convinces convinces a bunch of other publishers to publish other progressive books. What you're gonna do, guys? Do you want do you want progressivism or not? Do you want these policies or not? What what are you gonna do, guys? You you gotta buy the fucking book. If you want you want a higher minimum wage. You got to buy the fucking book. What can I tell you? Like, what a fucking capitalist piece of shit. That's not how you build a movement. Oh, if we just get enough books on the New York Times number one bestseller list, then, you know, socialism will win. Uh, you know, Bernie would have uh, won the presidency if his book had just sold a few more fucking copies. Like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. And it's also like, wait, Jink, hold on. If everybody's been begging you to buy a book, shouldn't you already have a fuck ton of people that want to buy it already? Why do you have to fucking piss and moan and grumble and grovel for us to pre-order your book so that it's on the amazon number one are you kidding me jake jesus christ every leftist author i've ever talked to has always been like and you can get it on Haymarket, you can get it on verso you know you can get it somewhere that's not amazon because um you know obviously they're union busting they're fucking one of the most here and i get it but just the idea that he's like immediately like his go-to spiel uh first thing on the tip of his tongue was like we we gotta sell it to everybody on amazon like as if that's the place where you should be uh you know promoting your book sales not local booksellers by all means anything like that you know all of the anarchist bookstores that uh, have gone out of business etc etc so he's just a complete clown here but he also just sounds like michael scott when michael scott was talking about writing a book it's like how i manage like you know i'm gonna write a book about management because i'm oh man and, and i'm gonna tell you what it's gonna be all about the road to success how i became successful you know uh when i'm thinking back on this on my yacht you know uh, about what it was like to just manage an office. You know, he like has that kind of energy, you know, that same like delusional energy where it's like he's going to tell us about something uh, in this book that apparently he couldn't tell us on his YouTube show that reaches way more people. Uh, why should all these people that have supposedly gotten all of your insight for the last like 10 fucking years on TYT, what new are you going to say in your book? And then why are you only saying it in your book if it's really um, you know, a message that you desperately want to get out to this many people when you have over, um, when you have millions and millions actually of, of, uh, YouTube followers, uh, subscribers, Twitter followers, etc. Um, if it's clearly about getting the message out, why aren't you putting out on your show? If you have this clear in like definitive roadmap to how we win, because we keep fucking losing Jake and uh, I'm waiting for you to start having good ideas. Exactly. And, and to just address this comment, um, Every grifter on the right has the same playbook, disappointed in the vanguard for using too much. Uh, why should we not be holding the left to a higher standard than the fucking right wing? Of course, the right wingers are grifters as well. Um, I don't want the left to be seen in the same light and the same obvious, you know, shameless grifting fucking capitalist light as the right wing is. Uh, of course, I'm going to criticize this because it makes the left look fucking terrible. I care about the same policies that Jenk is pretending he does in this clip. And I think this kind of shit actually hurts the cause. Uh, it makes us look like a bunch of shameless fucking grifters that are exploiting people's serious pain um, in order to sell books. It's it's disgusting to me, especially in 2021 during the height of the lockdown and the pandemic. Yeah. And also, if you tuned in like 10, 12 minutes ago, I literally made a joke about how this was the exact thing. It's like the right wingers that are always trying to sell you supplements. So we, we already made that joke. But until they can see it with their own eyes. So um, that's why other progressive books doing well has led us to a point where we're in a position where we could go to number one. 
And if we go to number one, I swear to God, there'll be 10, there'll be 20, there'll be 100 more books just like this. And that helps to further get the message out. And so we have a platform and you guys uh, are, are with us and we can make it go to number one and then unleash that. Right now, there's so many stereotypes in the mainstream media about how right wing does better. In anyway, so <laughs> I think you guys get the point. Um, pretty shameless saying essentially, you know, if you really want socialism or progressivism, Jenk doesn't even go so far as to call himself a socialist. Uh, if you want progressivism, um, uh, then, you know, we got to get this book to number one, guys, we got to get this motherfucking book to number one on the bestseller list. That way, uh, 50, a hundred more of them could come out. Like, bro, who the fuck do you think is going to be reading this shit? Like not anyone that's probably going to have their mind changed by it for one and also the kind of like working class non-voters that we really would need to inspire to come out to the polls in order to actually have like a serious progressive wave electorally get like a bernie sanders type into office or the presidency those fucking people aren't the kind of folks that are, i'm sorry they're just not the kind of folks that are going to read your dumb fucking book jank uh so you know that is what it is again if you actually had a book to sell, wouldn't necessarily have a problem with this. You know, I think Crystal and Saga remember when they wrote their book. Uh, it's it's not it's not totally out of the norm to have a book and to hawk it on your show. You know, that's pretty standard. So it's not like we're trying to be unfair here. The reason why this has to be discussed is because that clip came out in May fifth of twenty twenty. It's now April seventh of twenty twenty two. Um. Still no book, and I've been keeping track of this. Let's take a look at when exactly this book is expected to arrive, at least according to every online source that I have access to. Hmm, what's that? I can't quite make that out. September 25th, 2023. It's been pushed back once again. This shit was supposed to come out in 2022, and now it's been pushed back over a whole nother year from its original announcement in 2020, in May of 2020. So this motherfucker was begging his audience to pre-order a book to further the goals of the movement he claims to be leading. Uh, and it still has nothing to show for it. How many people fucking pre-ordered it? How many people pre-ordered it because they were actually gullible enough to fall for Jenks' line that, oh, well, you know, I mean, I'm sure there are people that sincerely listened to that and said, oh, he's right. You know, the progressives need to have more of a a presence in media. I'm going to go pre-order this book to try to further the goals of socialism. I need, you know, a higher minimum wage. I need health care. Maybe this is a way to do it uh, because that's what TYT is all about. It's all about tricking people into thinking that if you give them your money, then you're actually helping the movement. That's the bait and switch. It's like, oh, you get them hooked into TYT. You get them, you get your audience to think that, oh, by supporting us, you're actually supporting the movement. You're actually supporting the implementation of these policies when instead they're just straight up extracting your money. They're just enriching themselves based on, again, people's pain and desperation when they don't have enough money in their pockets already, when they don't have health care and to make it even worse during the height of the lockdown uh, during the 2020 pandemic. So this is totally shameless. And again, 2023, a whole nother year. Is this book ever actually going to come out? I'm starting to think that this is all fake. Or it'll be the uh, the the Morbius of uh, book releases, right? Like it just gets punted down the line forever. Um, or you know, uh, you know, there's an endless stream of cinematic references that we could make to to fit the bill. But uh, yeah, if it comes out, it's just going to be a total like fucking failure. Probably doesn't going to get buried. I can't imagine that a year from now. Jenk is anything but far less relevant than he is right now, uh, just because I think the TYT brand of politics is pretty much eroding. And you've made the exact point why, Gavin. Look, uh, we talk about on our podcast one of the real reasons why it's hard to get people active outside of the election cycle and outside of uh, you know watching progressive media and participating through donations and those kinds of things, door knocking at max, uh, is because it's hard to give people a really specific roadmap of what to do. Uh, it's hard to, you know, articulate like, yes, this is how, you know, you, you start sowing the seeds of unionizing, like supporting, uh, you know, your local chapters and these things, whatever. Uh, it's a little more opaque. It's not as clear cut what you need to be doing. Uh, it's not as e everybody's uh, environment is different. If I live in a really rural area, it's going to be way harder for me to be active than if I live in a really urban area, for example. And, you know, just what constraints there are on my life. And TYT shamelessly takes advantage of that, guys. They shamelessly take advantage of it, just like MSNBC does and Fox News do um, with their audience as well, respectively. Right. Uh, what they will do 
uh, is they will pretend that you tuning in and watching them talk about something is activism, that you're making the world a better place by gluing your eyes to their production and uh, extracting every single ounce of um, mo money that you have. It's the same co It's the same thing that churches do uh, when they're at their worst, right? Like, I don't want to paint with a broad brush. Oh, there are good churches out there. But uh, when they're the mega churches, the Joel Austin, isn't that the name of the guy that I'm thinking of? Yeah, those guys, they run their mega churches. Uh, you watch them on TV. They're televangelists. They say that you give them money and then they'll heal you through God and all this kind of stuff. That's essentially what Jank is doing. He's just a progressive televangelist at this point because he's not going to actually – uh, meaningfully do anything he's telling you that if you sell you know x number of bibles god's gonna do this for you like oh you sell x many copies of my book the government's gonna do this for you it's horseshit there's no uh truth in that unfortunately and he just uh you know can't um you know bear to not have that uh you know income of capital uh you know he you know he saw their numbers going down because people weren't interested in the post-trump era anymore uh they lost interest in that and that they'd really bet big on that um so it, it, they were willing to shamelessly grift even at the most desperate time. But yeah, shout out to Kelly for the super chat. How TYT still thinks they have left credentials after their constant dunking on criticism, hypocrisy, and faux outrage is just mind boggling as fuck. Yeah, I would agree, Kelly. I think it is mind boggling as fuck. And, and um, most people uh, in our audience, I don't think, uh, would um, take them seriously as like progressives or leftists in any capacity. Yeah, although I still see a fair share of, you know, simping for Jank and Anna, which which blows my mind. Again, after all of these scams, let's not forget about Wolfpack. Uh, let's not forget about the when they uh, raised a shit ton of money to hire people like Sean King, who only uh, produced four videos for them before disappearing into thin air. I think they raised like a million goddamn dollars to hire Sean King and other reporters, uh, the reporting of which never materialized. Why would you want Sean? I mean, I don't want I, No, I know. Why would you want Sean King? And I, I think a lot, of, I remember at the time, even a lot of TYT's audience was like, bro, no one, no one wants to watch Sean King. <laughs> like Sean King is an obvious grifter. He's a shameless piece of shit. Uh, so like they, they didn't even want uh, Sean King. But yeah, where did that fucking money go? And and again, this book is just the latest in a long, long line of scams from from the Young Turks. Um, super, super disappointing that people still simp for these two because it's really just shameless what they've uh, turned the progressive movement into online, what they have people associating with these policies that, of course, are worth pursuing. Of course, we want health care. Of course, we want a higher minimum wage. Um, it's too bad that some of the most popular biggest name advocates for those policies are such shameless grifters and such, you know, liars. 100%. It does look like we got a few more super chats. What's up, Gabe? Thank you so much for the 499, of course. But seriously, though, it is rather rich for TYT to eviscerate door for grifting when they do the exact same shit. And then some, yeah, that, that's the kind of uh, hypocrisy that I, I was trying to print out. At least, at, at least, you know, say everything you want about Jimmy. At least, uh, you know, during the pandemic, he was like, you know, nobody has any fucking money, blah, blah, blah. This is when I would tell you normally to donate to my show. And, you know, you can call that all posturing, but it was the exact opposite of what Jank was doing, which was trying to portray as if like somehow he has a struggling, I think, millionaire. I think that, he, you know, he's probably in the comfortable range of a millionaire. I would have to imagine at this point uh, is actually now struggling and that the people who make up his progressive audience, usually people who are the most financially unstable, right? Uh, tend to flock in progressive circles because they intimately understand the flaws of capitalism as it impacts them the most. Uh, he was going to still try and uh, get them uh, to fork over mo their hard-earned money as if it was the last thing standing between um, them and the death of the progressive movement uh, as you know, Trump faced off with Biden and Bernie dropped out and everything. Exactly. So thank you so much, Gabe, for the 499. Really appreciate that. Thank you also, Victor, for the 499. In the process of TYT trying to become bigger than the mainstream, they became mainstream light and became incredibly irrelevant. Exactly correct, Victor. And as you guys know, if you've been watching the Vanguard for a while, I used to really like TYT. Like, unironically, I used to enjoy the content. Um, and then it changed, like it straight up changed. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they took all that investment money and not to say that TYT was ever perfect n for sure. No, but at least it was, at least it was different. It was edgy. It had personality. They would swear on air. Uh, it had like a different vibe, you know, again, it had like a specific personality to it. And then they took all that money. Um, and the show was essentially gentrified for lack of a better word. You know, it got 
normified. They, they stopped swearing on air, all the kind of like in jokes and, you know, personality that defined the show dissipated. And of course, the, you know, way they were advocating for these policies and their implementation also softened quite noticeably. So, you know, it's really a, it's really a, 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 a important story to look at, I think, from the perspective of what this kind of attempt to to capture mainstream success can actually do to a show that was already very successful in its online niche you know tyt was around for so long um and they had a very you know devoted audience because again they they were different than the rest they weren't trying to be mainstream media they very specifically had their own brand their own vibe um again they would like you know, say the F word on air, just like us. Uh, and then they took all this money and this very clear pivot happened where, you know, now they're trying to be uh, the kind of show you could put on at like a restaurant or like a public venue. You know, if you own a business, they even said like, you should put on TYT if you own a, if you own a coffee shop or something stupid like that. And it's very clear that they're so desperately trying to have that kind of mainstream success. Um, and it killed the show. It just straight up killed the show. And of course, stuff like this too, with the shameless scamming, shameless grifting. Uh, of course, it turned people off. It left a bad taste in all of our mouths. And then numerous, you know, policy instances as well, where they were just total hypocrites, or you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you guys you know the change what got you to the dance, right? I mean, imagine if instead of going on Spotify, uh, Joe Rogan just set up every day on ABC, and he couldn't swear, and he couldn't smoke, and he couldn't drink. Uh, and he just interviewed people like, uh, you know, Jimmy Fallon style. Right. And they were pretending it was still the Joe Rogan experience. Well, of course, that wouldn't be the same Joe Rogan experience and it would be all sanitized and bullshit and everything that people liked about it in the first place. They would stop liking about it. Um, not not a perfect analogy between Rogan and TYT, but a lot of times that's what what happens when you, you know, you fuck up, you, you, you know, you change what got you to the dance and then you're no longer that same, uh, you know, people put it, putting out different perspectives. They used to have, uh, you know, as Gavin often points out, a, a potluck of ideas discourse real debate disagreements between the people that were uh existing on uh tyt and that was you know healthy and that was something that they were willing to lean into instead of lean away from and just have like whatever jank says and thinks is the bottom line and get the fuck out if you don't agree with me and that seems to be the poison that infects every kind of political show if it gets too big it's like one guy just becomes an ultimate narcissist and you either ride with him like anna did or you get the fuck out like jordan Sheraton did you know uh well uh, in other circumstances kind of contribute like to that. jimmy did i guess yeah, you could say jimmy <laughs> anyway uh thank you also jack for the 4.99 i gave no money to chunk yogurt but i should give my money to anna like in gentleman's club because all right yeah i see where you're going there thanks jack for the 4.99 really appreciate that one uh <laughs> won't necessarily comment on that but thank you nonetheless really appreciate the donation um let's move on to our next segment though <laughs> yeah um do you want to get into the nomiki cons shit Oh yeah, I think we have a, a a solid enough audience that has trickled in to get to today's real headline topic. Um, this one caught me by surprise because, um, despite her very milk toast and you know pretty just lame commentary in my opinion, you don't always see Nomiki Kant's really uh, take the knives out, you know, so to speak, really go for the jugular as she does in this recent majority report clip. Um, and I call this an unhinged rant in the title. Tell me if I was overstating. I don't think so though. Cause even Emma Vigland here looks low key uncomfortable as Nomiki Khan's, um, just goes full fucking steam ahead, attacking crystal ball, smearing crystal ball of breaking points. Um, so obviously, you know, we'll take a look here at the substance and address whether or not there's any merit to these criticisms. Spoiler alert, there's not. Uh, but let's take a look here again. This is surprisingly heated. You know, she, she clearly is um, mad. Let's just put it that way. But let's take a look here. But also, like, I'm sorry, Crystal Ball, with all due respect, and she is a friend of mine, I live in Queens, I live in Astoria, I'm literally half a mile away from where the first Amazon headquarters was going to be, you know who was the biggest advocate for that? AOC. You know who was not there? You. So if you sit here and you're playing who gets to be a progressive, you know, queen or not, and you're more, you're more interested in knocking down the few allies we have, I'd like to know, where were you in Bernie 2016? Where were you in Bernie 2016? It's always convenient. convenient. Wait, what, do you mean by, what do you mean by that? 2016! How oh. you and be the pure, progressive purist? Yeah, well, How look, I mean, do that? It's, it's a branding exercise for a show. Like, unless I'm over it. It's just ripping apart the left. That. 
but my point it's, is just uh, yeah, it's no, Roger I, Ailes I, politics I, though. I'm, I'm gonna continue. With- it's just ripping apart the left. I can't believe she would engage in this leftist infighting as I continue the leftist infighting and scold a fellow leftist. How dare you scold leftists as I scold you intensely? Uh, so there's more of this. We're gonna continue watching in a second, but just to address a few things she said here before I forget them. Uh, the Amazon warehouse that or the headquarters rather that AOC successfully prevented from being built in New York City. That was in 2019. Again, it's 2022 now. Um, maybe we should have an example from more than like two and a half to three years ago, if you really want to point to her, you know, progressive bona fides. And also, uh, AOC is a congresswoman, a literal politician who was elected by a progressive base of working people and donated to by a progressive base of working people specifically to do specific things. Crystal Ball is a fucking internet commentator. So I don't think she necessarily needs to be held to the same standard as far as, you know, where were you in 2016 or whatever? Like, okay, sure. But just because Crystal Ball wasn't a hundred percent, you know, a Bernie bro in 2016 in no way makes her criticism of AOC less valid. That's just like, what about ism? Like, well, you said this, but what about in 2016 when you did that? It's like, what is that is not even remotely addressing the substance of Crystal Ball's actual criticism. Yeah, she immediately just starts shrieking and changing the subject whenever, and uh, even like she credits Emma Vigeland. At least, like I, I've never said those words before in my life, but hey, at least she comes in here just trying to be at least a, like, like somewhat rational. And then Nomiki Khan just shrieks and continues to talk. About, Where is she to be? Like it was so that was unhinged, bro. That was a little wild. Like I've been unhinged before. I'm not like you know whatever it happens, but that's definitely what happened right there. And look, um. 2016 was six years ago. Uh, are we as the left going to tell people that over the course of six years, you're not allowed to politically evolve and then you're not allowed to practice your job as a, you know, a reporter or a news anchor or whatever you want to describe Crystal Ball as, you know, an online uh, political commentator, personality, whatever. That's her fucking job. Right. And you, you, she does nothing to address the actual substance of the criticism. She says, I live in Queens. She says, uh, AOC did this thing in 2019 and that if rising was around, they definitely would have, uh, made a video about, and crystal ball would have supported that a hundred percent. So self own right there. Uh, at the last time that I'd like, if she would have, she couldn't even come up with a more recent example, which was when she stood with the hunts workers, which was still over a year ago. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, because we've seen less and less and less and less of this. Um, so it's just complete ridiculous, but yeah, she has to go in all these weird directions, tangents, uh, because she can't address the fundamental criticism, which is why is AOC not standing with workers today, uh, when it counted and not until just retroactively to boost her brand. Absolutely. And thank you, by the way, for the $5. Hello, Kintu. Matt Letch and David Griscom are the best part of Majority Report. They have their own show called Left Reckoning that's great quality. Yeah, uh, from what I've seen of Left Reckoning, it is pretty decent. Definitely nowhere near as cringy as the Majority Report is these days. And once again, um, much like TYT, I used to enjoy the Majority Report to some extent. It was never my favorite show, but back when Michael Brooks was actually on the program, um, and he would sometimes, you know, give an actual leftist perspective and push back a little bit against Sam Cedar, uh, I enjoyed the show. Same with um, Jamie Peck's contribution to the conversation. When it was Jamie Peck, Michael Brooks, and Sam Cedar, uh, it was a it was a perfectly watchable show, and I, I don't mind the fact that you know not everyone on the panel has my same point of view. The problem is that now it's this ridiculous echo chamber um emma vigland for some reason was brought in to replace michael brooks which is just such a disgrace such a spit in the face to the legacy of michael brooks replacing him with a just a fucking you know mealy mouth commentator like emma vigland who you know no offense is just never has anything interesting to bring to the conversation again no not a personal attack i don't know emma vigland she's likely a lovely person um but she never has anything anything interesting to bring to the conversation and the rare occasion that i tune into the majority report um it's just like she's such a fucking wet blanket and then nomiki Kant, as you can tell uh doesn't offer much either um and then obviously sam cedar has just gotten more and more cringy with every passing year so uh, the state of the show is miserable now it's it's almost unwatchable in my opinion but yeah as you said yeah. matt letch and griskin are probably the best part of it for sure yeah, and, and, you know, those are OG TMBS guys, you know, uh, just to shout out. I was a big, big Michael Brooks show fan. And I I also still listening, listen to Left Reckoning a good bit, actually. I like David Griscom and, and Matt Leck. And, uh, you know, I think that they, you know, uh, have a lot of really uh, good analysis some of the times. They do some of the best left critique of uh, uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency that I've seen. Um, 
anywhere. Um, so, you know, shout out to those guys for doing that. I don't have any problem with Matt Letch and uh, David Griscom. I think they're good guys. And I don't have, yeah, kind of like Gavin said, like, you know, I'm sure uh, Emma Vigland is a fucking really lovely person to hang out with. But, uh, you know, no, no, no means to, didn't mean to get ad hominem. But yeah, let's take a listen to the rest of this, because if you can believe it, it continues to intensify. But this is Roger Ailes politics. Roger Ailes picks fights, creates fights, rides fights, turns things. Um, and frankly, AOC, you know, she was she, she should have responded, frankly. If she said anything, she'd have been like, I'm really supportive of the union effort. Congratulations. We're really proud of everybody. And then move on. But to respond to a YouTube host who wasn't even on the left five years ago. So I'm now we have like, no you can't evolve, but this You're is a YouTube an exercise here. And as much as I respect her and I like her and she's my friend, I just think that these choices are really dangerous and they're hurting the movement. And in three or four years, they're not going to look great. <laughs> Such fucking pearl clutching, too. It's like, uh, oh, how dare this commentator give her opinion on something? Crystal Ball, you're doing such damage to the left. This is so dangerous for the left. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? She's literally gave a respectful criticism on Twitter of a powerful politician with many, many times more followers than Crystal. Just pointing out something, literally just repeating the grievances of Christian Smalls, who was the leader or is the leader of the Amazon Labor Union. We're going to get to his comments on this in a second, of course. Um, but again, just such fucking pearl clutching. Like, Crystal Ball's job is to give her opinion uh to critique the left where she sees fit that's part of being a leftist commentator no miki by the way uh it's part of our jobs too is to critique the left part of the job is to critique the movement that we are a part of um you can't just sit here and never ever criticize your faction of the political spectrum like what kind of bullshit is that that's how the left is strengthened, not weakened. We have to be critical of one another. We have to be introspective and say, "Hey, this is bullshit." We have to call, uh, we have to call bullshit where we see it. And when AOC is out here, you know, refusing to lend her support to an important, probably the most important union movement in the country until after the fact, and then waiting in to say, "Oh, actually, I am supportive of this after it matters." Uh, I think that's at least worth acknowledging, right? Like, how is that dangerous? Yeah, dude. And it's also hilarious that as somebody who is a YouTube uh, uh, host, maybe she thinks she's extra credentials because she gets fucking spots on Fox News. But it's just like, who do you think you are? You're such a YouTube host. And I'm like, what is that boomer energy from you, Nomiki? What the fuck? Like, you literally do a show that's on the internet, too. Like, I hate, like, that's so, that's so, like, face planty. Like, I hang out around people who, like, think that uh, online media is a joke. Uh, energy like i can't even i can't even believe that she said that on an, on a literal youtube show like oh oh like is she like cucking all of us are we all just supposed to just sit here and shut the fuck up and not do our jobs like what are we supposed to do if not criticize these people that we uh in many instances donated money to uh you know spend hours championing them well guess what now i retract those hours that i spent championing them and i'm gonna open up my fucking mouth about it i mean it's just completely absurd and then the whole like thing where she wants to pretend that it's somehow dangerous to criticize a politician no it's really not that dangerous oh and, and I, like the weird implication like she's somehow like fucking i don't know at jeopardizing aoc security or like you know gonna strengthen the all right it's the same sentiment that like every, it got everybody outraged about the joker movie forever ago it's like this weird kind of like leftist uh, i mean we know that um no, Miki's very pro censorship. She's extremely pro censorship. Even, I mean, she was one of the first people to jump on the Joe Rogan should be censored bandwagon, right? And that's why they love to have her on Fox News, by the way, guys. It's because she's an easy caricature on the left to knock down. Uh, you know, people they hate having on the left or having people on uh, Fox News, uh, people who do a good fucking job. So if you get invited back on and, you know, you're kind of fucked up a little bit uh, or you served the role uh, that they wanted you to a little too well um you know uh that's usually the especially if you're just doing random spots where you go in and argue and it's like here's some random leftists that you don't know from anything else like you know um uh, it, it is what it is like if one day gavin and i get the call to go on fox news we're gonna go over there to make a mockery of it not to go out there and try and like stand up there and you know be like i want critical race theory taught in every single elementary school and i want all children taught about their gender when they're seven like you know i may th I think those things but that's that, that's not that's what fox news wants you to go do when you go on there um you know but anyway yeah there's a reason why they bring on no miki and not crystal ball 
Because if their viewers heard from Crystal Ball and heard her perspective, they'd say, oh, that actually sounds really reasonable. That sounds like an ideology that uh, kind of vi jives with me and my ideology. Because Crystal Ball knows how to communicate with normal people. And she doesn't come off like a shrieking, pearl-clutching, liberal moron like Nomiki Kans does. Again, all due respect, don't know her personally. Probably a nice woman. I don't fucking know. Um, but this is not the way the left should be presenting. And again, Crystal Balls, it's not like she came out and like out of nowhere and attacked AOC in the most ugly way possible. No, she literally just tweeted at her and said, hey, here's a clip of Christian Smalls himself on my podcast expressing some grievances with the way you handled this. Uh, that's all she did. No, Miki's the one here like fucking molding her eyes out, screaming, getting all aggressive, super mean, calling Crystal Ball like Roger Ailes for no reason. You're the one being unnecessarily divisive. You're the one that's fostering more leftist infighting for no reason. You're doing exactly what you're accusing Crystal Ball of doing. Uh, and again, as I mentioned on our stream when all this went down in the first place, Crystal Ball has, uh, despite whatever criticisms you may have of her, of course, Crystal Ball is not above criticism. Of course, there are valid reasons to criticize her. Um, but one of those is not the way she talks about and approaches unionization issues, labor issues. She is one of the best commentators, one of the best voices for union issues in this entire country, let alone on the left, in the entire country, in my opinion. She was covering the Amazon labor union story years before anyone thought it would be successful. She has been uh, a much, much better surrogate for that union than AOC ever dreamed of being. She has platformed Christian Smalls on her program, which, by the way, is way fucking bigger than Nomiki Khan's program. Uh, she has platformed those voices way more times than AOC has. So how is Crystal Ball the one the one that's an issue here? Again, she's actually a surrogate for these movements. She's actually giving a platform to these movement leaders. AOC is the one that's not. AOC is the one that's not waiting in because she thinks it'll be politically uh, unpopular to do so. She's the coward. She should be called out for that. And for you to sit here, Nomiki Kants, and wag your finger at Crystal Ball, who, as I said, is a better, more effective communicator and surrogate for mo union movements, you're just doing what you're accusing her of doing, which is unnecessarily fostering infighting and drama. Yeah, and also I just want to clarify, uh, because I, I took a shot at her for going on Fox News all the time, and we got some chats that are like, Glenn Greenwald and Jimmy Dora are Fox News regulars. Yes, and every single time Glenn or Jimmy is invited on Fox News, they are fulfilling a fucking role. Do you think Tucker has Glenn on to talk about all the shit that he thinks is wrong with uh, Donald Trump or the Republican Party? Uh, no, do they have Jimmy on to talk about uh, X, Y, or Z that's wrong with the Republican Party? No. Uh, you, you go on there, you get set up with uh, something that's going to make the Democrats largely look bad or the entire U.S. government look bad. One, those are your two options, usually. Uh, and, and those two individuals have said, OK, well, it's better for me to get this message out to those people. What they do not do is they do not go out there and make a terrible fucking caricature of the left that is easy to knock down. We actually look, uh, we're no fucking friends of the Jimmy Dore show. I, I think he hates our fucking guts and I don't feel too fondly towards the guy anyway. So I'm uh, like we critique him whenever we fucking want to. The last time he went on Tucker Carlson, he did chef's kiss miraculously for a lot of the answers here. He pivoted the conversation. He steered it uh, towards left wing commentary. Uh, you know, he made the case uh, uh, about, uh, you know, how it's rigged for poor people, all these kinds of things. Uh, and that's a good case to, to make on, on Fox News. What's not a good case to make on Fox News is to go on there and mauled and to be that like shrieking liberal, uh, you know, that pearl clutcher, that finger wagger, um, you know, that just kind of embodies all of their, uh, you know, suspicions and, you know, fears and, you know, stereotypes of the yeah. left. Yeah. Exactly. And thank you, Victor, for the 499. Looks like the old guard is resentful of new voices like Breaking Points that are exploding in popularity, but Breaking Points understands their audience and Majority Report doesn't. I definitely think that it has to be mentioned that there there has to be some element of jealousy in just how vitriolic uh, her delivery of this criticism is of her, of her friend, Crystal Ball, of her friend, Crystal Ball. Yeah, of course, there's some jealousy involved here because Breaking Points has a way bigger audience than the Nomiki Kant's show. The only time Nomiki gets any views is when she's invited on the majority report. And yeah, I mean, that's, that is what it is. Her own show gets like under a thousand views, a fucking clip. Like our videos outperform hers in a dramatic fashion. 
And um, our videos compared to the rest of YouTube eat shit. I, we're not tooting our own horn. That we're saying that is like how you're on the majority report and you reach a million subs and yet you still can't get your own fucking show off the ground. What does that say about your commentary? We're two blowhards from the Midwest. Yeah, give us a couple slots on fucking give us a couple slots on Fox News. Invite us on a big show like the Majority Report once a goddamn week. We would have like Ten times the audience we have. Obviously, no one wants to talk to us because we burned every fucking bridge there is to burn. Uh, but if we had the access to the massive platforms that Nomiki Kants did or does and has had access to, uh, you better fucking bet your ass that we would be getting a shit ton more views than we are. But even with that advantage, Nomiki still eats fucking shit because her message is not popular. She's a commentator that really doesn't uh, communicate well to anyone other than a very specific niche. Um, but you know, there is more of this video so we can watch a bit more before again, we hear from Christian Smalls himself, uh, whose grievances crystal ball was merely repeating. Yeah. I mean, I don't trust the, right. her incentives at all. Right. And I, I frankly, Justin, we're just going to let you go and keep up our conversation. But, if that's sorry, right. Justin, I'm, yeah. you, 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 yeah, you yeah, triggered yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I, I think my perspective on this issue is that if you do something like, uh, uh, Christian Smalls, uh, Chris Smalls did about unionizing a uh, uh, Amazon union, and you have problems with AOC. You you have the right to air those, even if like there's uh, concern that some per people in the media are going to use as a branding exercise, or even if people aren't um, sort of convinced about the utility of making this about uh, or you know firing back at AOC. Like I think, frankly, like it's the kind of heat. It's a much better heat than typically gets applied to AOC. I think it's one that could be constructive, but I. I mean, I, I do agree about media incentives to um, basically yeah. use this as a branding opportunity. I'm the 100% behind Chris in terms of, like, if he has, it, based on just, one, the fact of his enormous success, the fact that, like, he built this from the ground up in terms of, you know, there was, in, it, as you mentioned, uh, there were benefits. All right, to so if you're 100% behind Chris, uh, then, uh, oops, sorry, Zach then I imagine you're 100% behind what he had to say on this specific issue. Again, you're the one that's refusing to actually listen to Chris Small's own words while you pretend to be his ally. Um, but when people reference and give platform to his own goddamn words, uh, it's somehow an issue, even though you support him, which makes no fucking sense. But yeah, let's listen to this. This was a recent clip on, I think, Mehdi Hassan's show on Peacock. Um, he asks Chris Smalls about this specific issue and shout out, by the way, to good friend of the show, case study QB for doing the awesome hard work of putting together, uh, finding these clips and posting them on social media for channels like the Vanguard to react to. It's really, really important. Helps us out so much. Um, but yeah, let's take a look at this clip. Oh, and uh, really quickly. I just want to say shout out quickly to Mehdi Hassan, because I talked a lot of shit about him going on to MSNBC. But if there's one good thing about it, it is nice to have somebody who is you know, at least tangentially committed to the leftist causes that I am that will invite somebody like uh, Christian Smalls on to MSNBC when he likely wouldn't have otherwise had the opportunity. Uh, so don't always love uh, his commentary, but a shout out to him for facilitating this interview and exposing Christian Smalls to a lot of uh, people who he might not have had access to. Yeah, I mean, he's certainly uh, a more serious left voice than Nomiki Kans is. I'll just put it like that. But yeah, let's take a look at this again. This is what Christian Smalls himself who, as you just saw, Emma Vigland and Nomiki Kant's claim to be 100% in support of, uh, unless you're repeating his own goddamn words and his own goddamn grievances. And that, in that case, it's it's not okay. But uh, yeah, here's what he had to say when asked about the specific issue by Mehdi. Chris, Democrats like to say they are the party of the underdog, the party of labor, of workers. And yet the vast majority of elected Democrats in Congress, last time I checked, haven't said a word about your victory. How disappointed are you in the Democratic Party when it comes to the issue of labor rights? Well, you know, right now, um, there's a lot of buzz on, online about, you know, who supported, who didn't. And um, I want to clear the air on that. You know, um, you know they, they didn't support us. And that's just uh, a fact. You know, I know who was here on the ground with me every day. I know who came out to support us at our rallies. And it wasn't them. And it's not just them. It's a, it's a lot more people that are out there that uh, obviously didn't show up for, for these workers here in Staten Island. And it's a shame that, you know, they wait until, you know, we get to an election and we actually are victorious to come out and show their support, something that they could have done 11 months ago when this campaign first started. Um, so I'm just hoping that they can redeem themselves. You know, this, this is a marathon. Um, I don't have any ill will towards any of them. I just want them to do right by their constituents. We're here in New York. Doesn't matter what district you come from. 
Doesn't matter what district this building is in. These are all New Yorkers traveling from all boroughs. I know 8,300 of them. I know where they live. And I can tell you, they absolutely uh, represent um, these, you know, the politicians that they elected. So, you know, they all need to step up. And I'm talking to every last one of them. They all need to step up and make sure that they are taking care of these people. There you go. So right from the fucking horse's mouth. Literally, he all the crystal ball did was repeat his own goddamn words. I'll pull up the thread just in case anyone forgot. Uh, this is all the crystal ball said. Here's the guy who organized the union drive talking about how you left them high and dry. These are your constituents and you couldn't be bothered to show up until they're on the cusp of victory. Needless to say, that's a lot more goddamn polite than we are here at the Vanguard. Uh, it's also a lot more polite than Nomiki was when she was addressing Crystal's... Her good friend, Chris. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A lot more civil, a lot more polite than uh, than Nomiki was. And again, as we just heard from Chris Smalls himself, who you guys claim to support over at the Majority Report, um, that's how he fucking feels. That's his experience with AOC and the squad, is that they left them high and dry. So why can we not talk about that? How is it somehow dangerous to the movement to acknowledge reality to repeat the words the grievances and experiences of someone we're all supposed to be agreeing right now is a goddamn hero and a legend chris smalls what the fuck it's just mind-blowing honestly that we've reached this level of fucking degenerate leftist commentary but we are the ones that are being divisive gavin we are the ones that are sowing devout we're the ones that are being dangerous um no it's fucking crazy shout out to you clave sounds uh, Matt Lack, no thanks. Totally opposed to force the vote purely because he didn't like JD. Uh, look, I, we supported force the vote, uh, but I think I've, Matt Lack has called a lot of uh, good ones. Uh, so, you know, give him the benefit of the doubt. One missed uh, time up at the bat. Um, but yeah, you know, I get it if everybody else has their lines in the sand. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure. Uh, it is unfortunate that he didn't support force the vote, much like Ben Burgess, right? But I mean, that doesn't make his isn't the totality of his commentary dog shit. I still think Matt Letch has some good ideas sometimes, just like I think that about Ben Burgess. And um, yeah, I, honestly, I would, I would probably watch the majority report more if instead of Emma Vigland, it was uh, Ben Burgess. You know, he's a lot more interesting and dynamic of a commentator, in my opinion. But anyway, thanks for the super chat. Um, and and yeah, I mean, it is undeniable. And we obviously covered this at the time pretty heavily. How many people in the leftist space? People like Sam Cedar, people like Matt Letch, people like Vosh um, didn't support force the vote for the very transparent and obvious reason that be it was because they didn't want to give any credit to Jimmy Dore. And that's what we try to rise above here at the Vanguard. You know, we try to rise above the petty beef, the petty drama. We comment on it. But when it comes to actually where we're going to come down on an issue, uh, we're going to, you know, stick to our principles and be honest about our opinions. So, you know, regardless of what your grievance is with Jimmy Dore, um, force the vote was a good idea. That's undeniable. It was a good idea. And the left, at least the independent left media, should have come together behind that idea. Again, we talked about that at great length at the time and how obvious it was that people were putting their petty disagreements with Jimmy Dore above what was very clearly a strong and necessary um, strategy. So, yeah, th that's undeniably unfortunate. And, and that's I revealed by the fact that AOC told Justin Jackson that she was waiting to employ that kind of a strategy until something more tangible came up, uh, like $15 an hour, uh, committee seats, whatever she was uh, referencing at the time. And then, um, you know, it all came around. They did not, one, they squandered all of their leverage, but two, uh, they didn't get any of those other things either. So, you know, just putting that out there. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for the $5 super chat. Uh, clave sounds and uh, let's see we got another one too a little bit earlier from carolina boy for the 499 thank you so much carolina boy <laughs> why are the only two types of lefties left either corporate dim sellouts uh, or lame apologists for right-wing fascists <laughs> i mean definitely a bit hyperbolic with your wording there i'm not sure i'm quite prepared to call someone like Glenn a right-wing fascist but uh, I, I definitely understand what you're saying and I, we were actually you know discussing this earlier zach it seems like uh, there are very few channels that are successfully kind of, um, you know, hitting that sweet spot in the middle because, you know, both sides are kind of cringe at this point, if we're being honest, both the, you know, for lack of a better term, the shit lib left and the dumb, dumb left, you know, they're both increasingly cringy. And it, sometimes it does feel like we're the only channel that isn't just playing for one of the two teams and can actually call balls and strikes, can actually give our honest opinion undiluted by friendships and, you know, petty drama. 
Yeah, which is obviously ironic because we feast on petty drama, and that's the uh, you know main uh, talking points we have. But anyway, yeah, uh, you know, I, uh, why why is the left being that way? I don't know. Why is the Vanguard the only good podcast? Is what I really hear you asking. So just hit that subscribe and notification bell, and, and we'll give you all of our all of our good takes. And then I think Kelly, I don't know. Uh, Zach, you didn't organize with the local groups like DSA or Young Dem. I've never been a DSA or, or a Young Democrat. I did show up to some Our Revolution meetings back in the day, but it wasn't for me. Uh, that whole like world is so, especially in Kansas City, guys. You get like you show up to like a Sunrise Movement thing, or you go to the DSA events. Uh, a lot of times, you're dealing with like the NPR Farmers Market crowd. Um, you know, not exactly my favorite people to kick it with. So, you know, I, I support them when they do good things. But you're right. I'm not a I'm not a member of the Kansas DSA or, or Young Democrat. I don't know if that's a drag like, you know, Gavin, and I should be more involved, uh, I guess. But uh, anyway, thank you. <laughs> also, how did you know that, Kelly? How, for all you know, Zach is a is a young Democrat himself, a, a wee young Democrat. How the fuck do you know what he is? But <laughs> just joking. Thanks for the four ninety nine, Kelly. Really appreciate it. And thank you, David. David. It's been a while since we've seen David. David in the chat. What's up, man? Uh, ben Burgess and Sam Cedar are virtue signalers, softball players with politicians and oligarch. Jimmy Dore plays hardball, uh, unless he's interviewing Nick Brana, then he plays softball. But <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. Oh, thanks for the super chat, David. David. Yeah, Not necessarily. And- Oh no! I was just gonna say, look, Ben Burgess is an, uh, like, uh, like, yeah, you can have Sam Cedar, but look, Ben Burgess says he takes it from both sides, guys. Like, the dude is just honest about his opinions. Like, uh, you know, um, I feel like when he went on uh, Joe Rogan, he ate a lot of shit from people who are more on the like, you know, center side of uh, you know, his uh, ardent and always uh, unwavering support of socialism. Like, I just, I think it's hard to paint the guy uh, who's just like a regular working class dude that sells, you know. Uh, books for a living that he writes and if you read his books i've read all three of his books guys uh he's a really well educated really smart thoughtful guy so i get that he didn't support force the vote um but i still i don't think all of his ideas are worth like abandoning like i still one i also just think he's a really nice guy like fucking sue me yeah no ben burgess is a, is a really nice guy and a really smart guy and if you haven't read canceling comedians while the world burns it's an excellent book that i think most people even most like jimmy Dore listeners would agree with almost entirely um it, you know he has this kind of reputation of being grouped in with the majority report uh crowd for obvious reasons but in my opinion his his uh commentary and his you know ability to 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 uh, analyze these issues is, is on a whole nother level than a guy like sam cedar or someone like nomiki Kans or emma viglin so you know i think he almost disservices himself by being a part of that group but you know that's you know his decision i'm sure he has friendships and, and all that stuff but yeah i also like ben burgess which is why we talk to him on the vanguard sometimes so you guys know that but anyway thanks for the super chat regardless david david and thank you carolina boy uh you guys ben burgess and jordan Ch- <laughs> ben borgos and jordan charlatan are the only lefties honest lefties that i trust uh okay so that wasn't an m- intentional misspelling i thought you were uh shitting on jordan but uh, that's why i donate yeah uh th- fair thanks so much for the compliment thanks for the 4.99 uh yeah absolutely and um thank you uh for well you know there are there are more trustworthy lefties i was kidding when i said that we were the only trustworthy lefty show but uh thank you so much for including us we're in one of play. the very few <laughs> but yeah everyone is fucking grifting anyway thank you mike five dollars door plays hardball unless it's against nick brown at tulsi gabbard tucker carlson or the boogaloo boys and i mean yeah it, it is true like jimmy door will give kyle kalinsky endless amounts of shit for supporting democrats in in specific instances but you never see him confront a guy like tucker over his support of republicans right i mean tucker basically has the same you know lesser of two evil strategy that jimmy Dore constantly rails against that he literally accuses people of being cia for for espousing uh again just on the democrat side versus the republican side but anyway thanks for the super chat uh, thank you, Hysteric Raider, for the $5. The left has always been divided between the gentrified left and the working left. That class divide, I don't think we can reconcile because of NIMBY. Um, I mean, I don't. I think it's a little bit pessimistic to say that we can't reconcile it. I think that the Bernie campaign showed that it was impossible to, or it was indeed possible to build a, you know, a, a coalition of sorts between some of the more, you know, regular traditional voters, Democrat voters, um, and people that were non-voters, people that were working class and didn't necessarily feel that they had been represented in an electoral leftist sense yet. So, you know, I do think it's possible. It's definitely a, a difficult. It's definitely an uphill battle. But, um, yeah. Yeah, it's not going to be easy for sure. But I, I think that the Bernie Sanders was a good uh, foray into what could be and what, what is, uh, 
you know, possible. And obviously you're always going to have your like Elizabeth Warren in there or your Hillary Clinton or somebody who's like makes you a terrible person if you don't support them instead of, uh, uh, you know, the candidate that you actually enjoy. Like, remember, uh, actually, last night we were on our friend. Uh, friends of the show punch up pod and they had this sake bomb uh, that they would always do and they put together a clip of every single time they uh, had to, that she'd said that elizabeth warren was just a better bernie uh so you're always gonna have to deal with that kind of uh you know undermining as well uh, but i think bernie uh showed that uh you know if you played your cards right uh which i feel like in a lot of times he didn't uh you know you could have come out victorious um but yeah. Well, damn. Thanks for everybody for these super chats and Clave Sounds. Thanks for uh, responding. I take your point. Burgess and Lech make good points. I just wonder, can you trust people who put their media alliances ahead of public advocacy? Uh, see, I don't think Burgess was honest about forced to vote. I actually think he was honest about forced to vote. When we had him on our show last time. He actually uh, massively disagreed with Sam Cedar and the majority report when they had, uh, you know, people like Nomiki Khan, Sam Cedar had uh, called for the censorship of uh, Joe Rogan. He wrote an entire article about it. And, you know, while I disagreed with the points that he wrote about in the Jacobin piece I'm about to reference, he did write an entire uh, piece in Jacobin uh, about why he thought that uh, the risk reward associated with uh, force the vote was uh, not worth pursuing. Um, most people just railed against Jimmy Dore. This man did take the time to write an entire piece. Again, that I disagreed with, but I respect the fact that he at least took the time to write out an argument, a compelling argument to him uh, and produce it to the world. And it was, it had absolutely nothing to do with Jimmy Dore. And when we confronted him about it, he said, these are my actual criticisms. And it bothers me when the criticisms devolve into, did you see how big Jimmy Dore's house is? He can't possibly be trustworthy. Like uh, those were verbatim conversations that we have had with him. Uh, and he's not afraid to discuss it and he's not afraid to, you know, discuss our disagreements. So, um, you know, that's, you know, but I, I also I take your point. Like I fucking massively disagreed with him on that as well. But, uh, you know, it's kind of like Glenn Greenwald. I massively disagree with Glenn Greenwald on all sorts of shit. Glenn knows we massively disagree with him on shit. He kind of likes to make jokes about it sometimes when he comes on our show. Right. He's friendly about it. But at the end of the day, I still think that uh, Glenn and Ben Burtis are just, you know, wealth of knowledge uh, when i read either of them their books they're writing i can tell you guys have studied you guys know more than me and i want to absorb that knowledge and i think it's you know a little foolish to write people off because i disagreed with them one time it's like yeah we disagreed with noam chomsky on force the vote i still learned so much about the world from manufacturing consent uh so that's kind of how i try and balance that right i mean we were just disagreeing with chris hedges the other day about uh twitter and, and all of that stuff yeah, yeah of course you can disagree with people and and yeah i hardcore disagreed with Ben Burgess. Like I said, I personally don't understand how someone would not see force the vote as a clearly, obviously good idea that it was. Uh, but that being said, I, yeah, I agree, Zach. I think he was being honest about it. I don't think he was just dishonestly crafting this massive argument against it because he didn't like Jimmy Dore. And the reason why I think that is for one, what he said on our podcast, as you referenced Zach, but also the fact that he's one of the only, you know, folks on the kind of majority report circuit that will engage with a guy like Joe Rogan or Glenn Greenwald, two people he has had interviews with. Or the Vanguard. Or the Vanguard, exactly. Uh, he's actually someone that he's not into this whole like personal, petty, like, you know, I'm just going to dunk on Jimmy Dore and yada, yada, yada. No, he actually thinks out his positions. He actually has a reasoned process. Um, in which he comes to his conclusions. And I do respect that, again, despite the fact that we disagree. You know who else I disagree with? Fucking Glenn Greenwald, Joe Rogan, uh, almost everyone. There's no one I don't fucking have disagreements with. We can't get hu so hung up on one disagreement that we refuse to you know, consider the other righteous and accurate points someone makes. But anyway, appreciate the $10 regardless. Really appreciate the engagement, Clave Sounds. Um, and thank you also, Gabe Newell. David unwittingly just proved the point of the other super chatter, the constant need to simp for the door side uh, of the left or the MR side. And, and yeah, it's one of the most annoying things. No shade to David. David, but it's a, you know, it is a very um, observable trend. People, you know, they only want to play for their one team, either your team, Jimmy, or your team, Sam Cedar and there's no giving credit to the other side ever. It's forbidden. If you give credit to Sam Cedar and you're a Jimmy Dore leftist, then it's fucking taboo uh, and vice versa. And that's so fucking annoying because again, everyone makes good points. Everyone also makes dog shit points. It's like, yeah, I can agree with Jimmy Dore on these handful of issues and I can agree with Ryan Grimm on these handful of issues. What What is this need to be so tribal? What is this need to be so fucking, you know, reductive? It's so annoying. 
Yeah. Uh, shout out to David. David though, got a lot of love for you, man. You were an early listener, held it down for the Vanguard back in those dark days. So you know, appreciate uh, you getting back in the super chat, even if it was, um, you know, uh, maybe you're not loving our commentary today. It was good to good to hear from you. You know, nice little throwback. So thank you very much for that. And also, uh, just really quickly to address a, a non super chat that just a sentiment that I'm seeing uh, that relates to that is is it's a uh, you know you're either like giving too much credit to Jimmy Dore instantly. Um, you know, like if I say something about how I thought he did a good job on Fox News or, oh, if he made a good point in an argument the other day or did a good job in an interview where they, you know, extracted some insight that I valued or whatever, uh, you know, then, oh, my gosh, blah, 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 blah. Why are you supporting this person? You know, and it's the same thing if I say something nice about Kyle Kalinske. Somebody gets triggered. It's like, you guys are always so easy on Kyle Kalinske. It's like, ask Kyle Kalinske if he feels like we've been fucking easy on him, right? You guys are so easy on Jimmy. It's like, ask Jimmy if he feels like the Vanguard's been easy on him, okay? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. It, 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 it's not like that. But anyway. We, we get- simp for no one. We simp for no one. There is no commentator on either side of the left spectrum that we will not criticize and also that we will not get Give credit where it's due which is one of the things that makes us unique as a channel if you guys haven't noticed most channels are playing for a goddamn team because they want access they're fucking access journalists uh it is what it is and we don't play that fucking game i'm sorry we don't and it's something i'm actually super super proud of so yeah you're gonna hear us criticizing kyle you're gonna hear us criticizing jimmy you're gonna hear us criticizing sam cedar vosh and also giving all of those people credit where it's due and apparently that just breaks people's fucking minds that we can't just a hundred percent of the time agree or disagree with someone as if this is a fucking like sports game and we have to root for the chiefs our home team just because that's where we live like no that's not how this works this is a nuanced conversation an evolving conversation sometimes we're going to agree with some people sometimes we're going to agree with other people that's how life is and if you view things other than that then maybe you're living in a goddamn echo chamber have you ever considered that yeah, did want to get to these uh, super chats really quickly. Like Chris had just said, you go places where your voice can be heard, even if you disagree. That's why Ben B will go on Majority Report. Same for others. Yeah, and probably the same reason why he comes on our show, uh, if we're being completely frank. Uh, so, yeah, 100%. Oh, yeah, and I don't blame anyone for going anywhere, frankly. Like, that's something else that I find annoying as fuck. Uh, yeah, it, it's super annoying when people get all triggered because Kyle Kalinske went on Joe Rogan. How dare you platform this fascist? Shut the fuck up. Uh, on the other side of that, yeah, it's also annoying when people try to shit all over Ben Burgess because he goes on the majority report. It's like, obviously, you're going to go where you're invited if you're going to get access to a bigger platform, if you're going to be able to get your message out. Of course, the Vanguard would go just about anywhere where we were invited. Uh, that, does not, that doesn't mean we fucking sign off on all the opinions of said show or said host. Uh, no, that's just how things work. So, yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, it's the same reason same reason we defend people that work for RT or that work for the New York Times sometimes. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway, stupid as fuck. But anyway, thank you, Levon Huey, for the four ninety nine. It is safe to say uh, AOC and Nomiki Kants are erasing black voices. They respond to Crystal Ball repeating Chris Smalls instead of Chris Smalls himself. Uh, I mean, sure, I, I guess. I don't. I mean, sure. I don't know if it was intentional or not. But the 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 end, you know, point that they end up making is that um, Crystal Ball is somehow doing something wrong. In fact, something dangerous, in the words of Nomiki Kants, by quite literally just repeating and linking to the words of christian small so in a sense yes they are yeah uh, i mean yeah and honestly a uh, uh, working class voices too might be the real crux of it i, I don't think that if uh, you know christian smalls was out here like cheerleading for amazon that you know, i don't I, I don't think i don't necessarily think that it had to do with the fact that he was a black man if we're being like cards on the table but gavin's right the end result was the same uh you know i think that if we're being you know in my analysis it was probably much more about the fact that he was unionizing the um Amazon workers than why AOC and people, you know, like Neil Miki Consta, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think it's because he's a black guy if that, if that's what the question is, but the end result is the same. That's a hundred percent correct. And uh, also thank you guys so much for the, the super chats today. It really is a uh, um, one. It's great to facilitate the conversation this way, but it's also just super nice to, um, you know, see the donations and, you know, understand that you guys are enjoying the show. Uh, Mike H wants to know, what is the deal with Jackson Hinkle? We've talked about that 10 million times. I just don't want to get into it anymore. Um, I feel like everybody on the internet knows that we're, we're not uh, best buds with that guy. So we can just move on. Who's, who the fuck is Jackson Hinkle? <laughs> yeah. I've never heard of that. Steal Jimmy's, Steal Jimmy's joke. Who? Yeah. Who? <laughs> what? Who the fuck? Uh, but thank you also, Boeing 757 Pilot, for the $10. Tribalism runs rampant, and it's sickening. You two definitely aren't cheerleaders. Good job. Well, thank you so much, Boeing. And it's exactly viewers like you who we do our show for. Um, we're not interested in affirming uh, your guys' pre-held biases or you know 
it, contributing to the echo chamber. No, we're, we're here to give our opinions, uh, whether you like it or not. And if you enjoy it, then that's great. And if you don't, then you can go watch Hacks and Stinkle. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it is what it is. But yeah, thank you so much for the 10 bucks, Boeing. Really, really appreciate that. As always, great to see you in the chat and really appreciate the support. Yeah, I love hearing from you, man. Gavin and I talk about how it's so crazy that, uh, you know, you've traveled around and still listen to our show in all these weird places. We were talking about that the other day, actually. So anyway, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, and also, just because this is the literal perfect question for me, Sir Switch, I'm going to steal it from Gavin before he even gets to answer it. So uh, I, sw I swear to God, this is the, cancel me. I don't care. Uh, Amy Winehouse, I think, is, is going to be on the short list of like top 12 female vocalists of all time, dude, of all time. Dude, that Back to Black album, oh, a classic, a 10 out of 10, Fantano scale, just a perfect masterpiece. And Adele is boring as shit. So that's my opinion. Uh, I'm definitely no huge fan of Adele, although to be honest, I know this is an extremely unpopular opinion. I also think Amy Winehouse is a tad overrated. I know. I'm I about to come over the chair, Gavin. <laughs> Fuck Animal Collective. <laughs> <laughs> David Lynch makes bad. I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, but I, I just I don't love Amy. I guys, I, I mean, I, she has a great voice. No, obviously, uh, but I don't know. I don't know. To me, every one of her songs just sounds like a goddamn James Bond intro theme. You know, when they do the, <laughs> when they do the intro at the beginning with the animation. Anyway, uh, but I, I I guess she's better than Adele. Adele's super boring, like Zach said. No offense to any Adele lovers. Definitely not for me either. So you know, I, I would say Amy Winehouse over Adele, despite my uh, you know slight criticisms of Winehouse. But anyway, thank you so that much for the two bucks. Ghost face on Back to Black. Or... It was I'm No Good that has the ghost face feature on the hidden track, if you guys are ever interested in. in I don't Wine think I've actually heard that one, so maybe that'll change my mind. Uh, but anyway, thanks for the two bucks, Sir Switch. Always appreciate it. Uh, thank you also, Hysteric Raider. If there's anything that trickles down the team sport mentality, we want to feel like we belong to a team so we can never give the other side credit. That is true. Um, but also, I, I think something that a, a lot of people don't realize it, that I didn't realize, you know, until I started doing this job was that a lot of it is about access. You know, we hear a lot about access journalism when it comes to politicians. Um, but when it comes to being a smaller channel on YouTube, a big part of the grift is getting access to you know, your favorite commentator. And that person usually has a lot bigger of a platform than you. And then that leads to this kind of weird, you know, relationship slash, you know, online uh, allyship. And then it it manifests itself in a refusal to criticize that person in fear of losing access, especially when said person tends to be super petty and narcissistic and can't take criticisms. Um, so that, that's a big part of it too. And again, we're not in it for that. We're not trying to get access to someone. If, if anyone wants to come on our show, obviously they're free. We'll invite them, uh, but that's not going to stop us from being honest about how we feel about them. That's not going to stop us from criticizing that person. And obviously we've been through that ringer a number of times now, um, but thank you so much for the, yeah, and I, think, I think you can tell a lot about the people that will come on our show uh who still comes on our show regardless of our like criticisms you know glenn comes on our show even though uh you know obviously there's no secret where there's a massive bit of ground between our politics ben burgess still comes on our show um you know uh the, the list is small and then obviously like other channels that kind of do what we do muck break but like you know what i mean very few people are willing to still come and i mean that is literally like amongst the list guys that are like a one-off from like a college professor that's like the kind of rotation we have now jordan Cheriton, oh, ron jordan, yeah, yeah. yeah jordan and ron those are two guys that also do but you can tell a lot about people that uh you know are willing to come in and sit in the hot seat with us because they never know what the fuck we're gonna say you know um and, and yeah anyway and and just uh you know because you mentioned Glenn Greenwald, one of the reasons why I do respect Glenn Greenwald so much is because he actually does engage with his critics. He's not this petty, narcissistic, echo chamber creating loser that refuses to engage with people that disagree with him. No, he'll come on a show like Bad Faith Podcast and do like a two and a half hour long debate with a guy like Nathan Robinson and and politely hash out their disagreements and explain his side. He literally invites random Twitter trolls like critics of his onto his show to give them their time to say their piece and to respond and, and do. So I really respect that about Glenn Greenwald. And as you said, Zach, uh, when he comes on our show, he'll even joke about the fact that, yeah, tomorrow, if I say something you guys disagree with, I know you'll, uh, you'll, uh, express that disagreement. So, you know, that's, that's uh, like something. the cringy ass Bitcoin thing, man. I, I, you could not get me to sign off on Bitcoin in any fucking capacity, but I know Glenn's really into it right now. Like no way. Yeah, I haven't seen his comments on the Bitcoin thing yet, but you were telling me about that. And I also am not a crypto guy. But anyway, uh, thank you for the two, the five bucks, Hysteric Rate. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Mike H., for the two bucks. What do you think of Jackson and Brittany Mahomes? I mean, 
he's a great quarterback, but not much outside of that. I don't really know anything about his wife. Oh, yeah, that's his wife and brother, I think, that they're act- action about. Not Patrick, but Jackson. Oh, yeah, obviously. Jackson's the super cringy TikToker. Yeah, fuck that dude. Yeah, I was like, we don't think about him much. Uh, the bar that's down the street uh, from where I work uh, is the one where he had that, like, famous fucking incident where uh, he – you know they kicked him out and then they gained like 10 million twitter followers or whatever but yeah he's kind of a dunce uh and uh you know whatever i really i do think patrick mahomes is doing his best though and he's a fucking phenomenal quarterback and that's all i really care about yeah patrick mahomes seems like a good guy but yeah jackson seems super cringy um thank you for the question thank you sean for the 499 emma and nomiki don't hold a flame to crystal they are hacks uh yeah that's true um not only are they are their opinions for the most part pretty hackish uh also they're just not as good of commentators so there's that too which i think is why there's a lot of jealousy there at least from nomiki emma seems a little bit more reticent to go after crystal but nomiki was just full fucking bore you know uh criticizing her so thank you for the full vanguard approach <laughs> exactly yeah emma's over there like like Shh, you're gonna give those vanguard boys a, a subject matter for a new video shut the fuck up don't don't give them any fucking don't give them any fuel. <laughs> I don't think she thinks that much about us, but thank you so much for the super chat, Sean DeStefano. And thank you, uh, Jacques Koff. Um, what do you think of Second Thought? Oh, sorry. Oh, I watched Train to Boisson recently. Oh, because of the horror movie episode you did a while back and enjoyed it. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I've heard very many good things about that. heard it's one of the best zombie movies. But Gavin, I know you've seen that film. Yeah, I've seen Train to Busan a couple of times. Great, great fucking movie. Absolutely a masterpiece of modern horror cinema. One of the best uh, zombie movies, honestly, ever made. So great to hear that you watched that via our recommendation. That's dope. Always love hearing from people that uh, you know actually took one of our recommendations to heart. So that's awesome. I'm I'm, I'm not surprised you enjoyed it because it's a fucking amazing movie. So thanks so much for the five bucks and really appreciate the fact that you're chiming in on uh that subject matter thank you so much and also thank you for jacques 499 what do you think of second thought uh you go pink marxist paul and tanky i don't know any of those people so i'm not going to give an opinion on them yeah gavin and i typically don't have a political philosophy that is uh described as tanky but i also don't know any of these people or their worldview so i uh, appreciate the 499 contribution and uh we'll take a little a uh, bit of a look into that. I'll, uh, you know, see if we can't, you know, maybe respond in uh, better next time. Uh, but thank you so much for the the donation. Uh, we really appreciate. It. Yeah, thanks so much. And and the whole tanky thing is interesting because that word gets thrown around so much. And sometimes it is accurate. Like sometimes there are people that are just like straight up apologizing for authoritarian governments. Um, you know, places like Russia or China and refusing to acknowledge that there's any issues with those countries and their governments. But it also sometimes gets erroneously applied to someone like Noam Chomsky, for example, who was just out here, you know, talking about. Uh, the reasons why Russia is doing what it is doing in Ukraine and giving some of that context. You know, some people would look at that and call him a tanky because you're justifying the invasion when in reality he was just giving historical context. So I don't like the fact that the word tanky is thrown around as much as it is and the fact that it's often used to erroneously describe people who aren't even actually tankies. Um, But as for the folks that are legitimately defending and apologizing for authoritarian regimes um, that literally jail their critics and are cracking down on homosexuality and stuff like that. Yeah, like obviously, I'm not going to fucking defend your fucking nation state, dude. I'm not going to defend any nation state. So I think that's ridiculous. But thanks for the 499. And again, I haven't heard of any of these content creators. Embarrassingly enough, I, I'm surprised. Yeah, are these like Twitch streamers, Jacques? If you just like contribute in the or like just put in the chat, we'll find it. i would just be curious to know like what context are these, these people like. I mean, like second thought, like sounds like a streamer name, but you go Nick and Marxist Paul, like uh, those, maybe there's Twitch guys, maybe they're YouTubers, maybe I just don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Kelly, for the 1999. Hey, coming through with a fat donation. Really, really appreciate that, Kelly. Super generous. Really helps out the show. Refusal to accept and hear out criticism in my experience is either a a reluctance to admit where you might be wrong, or b a refusal to admit that they haven't fully thought out or mapped out consequences of said positions yeah i think that's i think that's totally fair i think that's completely accurate um and yeah it's one of the things that really grinds my gears is when someone just absolutely refuses to engage with criticism of themselves it's one of the reasons why i like doing a live show because you're forced to confront criticisms via the chat you know if you're talking some bullshit and the audience disagrees with you they're gonna let you fucking know 
uh, and you have to confront it in real time. Again, I like having that accountability for my own audience, uh, even if sometimes it frustrates me. You know, uh, I enjoy that, and and I and I think it's a, a net gain to have that exposure with criticism and with other perspectives. What I hate is when people just you know plug their ears and and go bah! instead of actually confronting, acknowledging their critics and and pretending that it doesn't exist. I think that's pretty intellectually weak. Yeah, 100%. And I think that's a, like, I mean, honestly, not only do we have to grapple with the chat, but we have to grapple with each other. Gavin and I don't always agree. We have to uh, be intellectually honest. If I say one thing on air for cloud and one thing in private, Gavin will be like, what the fuck is the matter with you? Just three days ago, we were talking and you said this, like there is no filter between what we talk about off air and what we talk about on air. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that you have to be able to have the mental fortitude. And you, you say that people have you know, fully mapped it out or thought out the consequences of their positions. If that's the case, uh, then of course you're going to be able to respond to pushback. It, it would be like, you know, Gavin and I being afraid to go on and debate Medicare for all. Like, you're not going to change my mind. There's no pushback that you can give me because I already am fortified in my position, right? Like, I already literally know uh, that it's cheaper. I know that it saves lives. Uh, I know that we can streamline um, individuals' experience with the, the doctor, make it less bureaucratic. Uh, and do all of those things uh, successfully through Medicare for all. Now, I would be down to debate the minutia of the legislation because I'm not a policy wonk and an expert on those kinds of things. Um, but from a moral standpoint and just a, a global worldview standpoint, like I would be happy to hear any kind of pushback against that and defend my position heartily uh, just because I understand that uh, position. And I just use Medicare for all because that's kind of like one of the bedrock issues of our show. Uh, but it could be anything, universal college, debt cancellation, uh, anti-imperialism, uh, the things that we've thought really long and hard about. Um, and usually when you just want to plug your ears and run away, it means you have a very fragile worldview. Uh, and that's why, you know, we remember the very flimsy early like 2010s era with the social justice warrior first coming off. And, it, you know, everybody was a problematic person. And once somebody was established and labeled as problematic, you could not fucking engage with them. It was like the origins of cancel culture, et cetera, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and again, I think that just replicated a weak worldview, which is why I used to have people like ContraPoints that would go out and create like a fortified argument for the justified things, although she's become kind of a parody herself. But anyway, thank you so much for the $20 donation. Yeah, thank you very, very much, Kelly. Really appreciate that generous donation. Um, and yeah, it's one of the reasons why I also like to listen to a lot of debates, even with uh, debaters that I don't necessarily agree with. It's because I enjoy hearing out other perspectives and it helps me fortify my own arguments, having an understanding of the uh, oppositional perspective. So again, thank you so much for the comment. Really appreciate that. Also, thank you, Sir Switch, becoming a YouTube member. Hell yeah, bro. Uh, officially becoming a Vanguardian. That's dope. Thank you so much for becoming a YouTube member. And if you guys don't know, aren't familiar, um, we do have a YouTube membership program. So if you guys want to join for as low as I think $2.99 a month, um, you can become a YouTube member. Uh, and that gives you access to all of our emojis in the chat, including a shit ton of Pepe's. So hit that up, hit that up, spam the chat with them Pepe's. But thank you, Sir Switch. Really appreciate it. And what a, my, a lot of people might not know about Sir Switch Cookington is that he's actually Gavin's father. <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> but he does like to accuse me of being Crystal Ball's son. So there's that. Anyway, thank you, Sir Switch. Really appreciate that. And thank you, Eugene, for the two bucks. Opinions on Ben Norton and Graham Elwood. Uh, appreciate the donation. I mean, Ben Norton, I agree with a fair amount of the time. And same with Graham Elwood. I also have some serious disagreements with them both. I think Graham Elwood in particular, I my my biggest disagreement with Graham is uh, his, you know, embrace of cryptocurrency. He is a huge crypto bro. Uh, so that's an area of disagreement. And, you know, nothing necessarily comes to mind with Ben Norton, but I'm, I'm sure I've disagreed with him in the past. To be honest, I don't really consume a ton of uh, ben nor Graham's content, but they both seem like good faith actors to me. Yeah, they seem like really nice guys. I know Graham's buddies with our friend Ron Placone, uh, so that's cool. And Ben Norton, you know, I've read I read more of his reporting when he was still with the Gray Zone, but I know he's moved on. Uh, and he does a lot of really solid Latin American r reporting, from what I know. So, uh, you know, as far as I know, they both do good work, even if we have like you know some disagreements with them. Absolutely, and it does look like that's it for our super chats. So do you want to comment on any other stories today, Zach? Oh, man, geez, we've been going for like an hour and a half. I was just looking at that. I think, I mean, honestly, for today, we can probably wrap. That was uh, a good-ass show. We had a lot of engagement today. Uh, Shout-out to everybody that uh, watched, uh, chatted, super-chatted. 
um you know all of those kinds of things really appreciate you guys and then also a special shout out to our patrons for keeping our show running around but uh yeah did you have another uh, one one more thing i wanted to quickly comment on we can make it super quick though um no need to go in depth here but something i thought was worth sharing real quick is the recent changes at the intercept this is pretty crazy the intercept has laid off nearly 20 staffers um which is very you know, unfortunate for those people that have lost their jobs, of course. But, you know, this is an interesting article in the Daily Beast, and it talks a bit about the Intercept, First Look Media, and Pierre Omidyar. Um, And, you know, like I said, it's super fucked up that this has happened. Um, Something that I think is specifically worth pointing out, I'm trying to find it. Yeah, here we go. Founded in 2013 by eBay creator Pierre Omidyar, First Look Media houses not only The Intercept, but also the Press Freedom Defense Fund, a nonprofit media support group, as well as documentary film studio Field of Vision and for-profit content studio Topic Studio uh, and streaming service Topic. Uh, Am I the only one that had no fucking idea that The Graza or sorry, that The Intercept uh, had a streaming service and a a content, a for-profit content studio? Like, what the fuck? I think this is just super indicative of how uh, an organization like the intercept is throwing money at what they think will be hip to the youth and stuff. Oh, people these days are into streaming. We better get in on that. Right. And meanwhile, no one wants to subscribe to the intercept streaming service. Like there's already a fucking 20,000 streaming services out there. So many God, more streaming services than are necessary. That's for sure. So I think it's indicative of the fact that they're having to lay off 20 people seemingly because they threw all this money. They wasted all this money uh, trying to make a streaming service happen, uh, which again, no one knows exists. I didn't even know this existed and I consume a lot of news content. So I think this is indicative of them wasting a shit ton of money, trying to throw it at these kind of intangible goals in hopes of, uh, you know, getting in on the new trends. And meanwhile, their actual reporting, their actual force of journalists is suffering as a result. And I think that's just, you know, pretty, uh, again, indicative of a lot of the dumb mistakes being made by the upper echelons of elite media and journalism. Oh, a hundred percent. And I, I think what they were probably trying to do, even with their documentary, uh, like film production company, I, re- I just looked it up because I was like, oh, maybe this is something that they acquired when uh, Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald had you know, been making uh, Citizen Four, and and that was a big reason why Piero Media. No, this was the first movie that they put out was in 2018, Gavin. Uh, so and, and it's a bunch of do- Gavin and I are extremely plugged into the film world. Okay, uh, Gavin, did you hear about the film Scenes from a Dry City? Did you hear about the film uh, MLK slash FBI? Um, Actually, like, I did hear about that one. To be honest, okay, to be, okay, well, you're really plugged in, though. I hadn't heard about that, and and this one does look like their highest budget film that they put out. That came out in 2020, um, you know, and it's uh, it looks like it got distributed by IFC. So it's like they're making real movies, um, but this is definitely a, a costly endeavor. And I feel like what people really know about the Intercept and First Look Media is their um, reporting, uh, and and I think it's correct to make sh- sure that we point out that you know these like weird like silicon valley brain rot solutions like oh we're gonna have our own streaming service topic and we're gonna have topic studio producing that production you know and producing all that content it'll be amazing yada yada it kind of gets out of the way of like no people want to have a fucking newspaper basically from the intercept like a couple podcasts are cool um some readable content hey if you want to make a show where it's kind of like uh like rising or breaking points and you know you could even get away with that but but after that people are like stop it i'm looking for that from somewhere else from some other kind of creator um so you have that which seems like a a burning pit of money because you guys have no idea how expensive it is to make documentary films it's fucking expensive as shit and there's like no return on investment for any of it um most of the time unless you win like a fucking oscar and even then you can still sometimes lose your ass um so content is really expensive and then you have on top of that massively bloated salaries from the upper echelon of the intercept i mean straight up like obviously that's not the biggest concern uh, but i'm sure if you're making like you know 65 grand as a beat reporter and investigative journalist uh and you get laid off you're like how the fuck are there people making 350 400 racks a year to write you know 10 stories a max you know what i mean uh and you're like how is that a balanced you know egalitarian progressive work environment uh, I would have those beefs if I had gotten fired, if I was one of the 20 people that had been laid off. Um, but anyway, I also think it's probably that they're burning a bunch of fucking money uh, on uh, something that will never be a success. Right. 
Yeah, and obviously documentary filmmaking is a valid pursuit and is a, a valid form of journalism in and of itself. So uh, no shade on them to producing documentary content. And I have heard of MLK and FBI, the documentary they made. I heard it was quite good. So again, that's not an issue they're doing that. I think the streaming service whole thing is, is really the problem. It's like you can make content, you can make video content documentaries without trying to create this whole streaming infrastructure for it. Just distribute them you know, into the into the market and they'll be consumed. No one wants an intercept streaming service. Like, I'm sorry, that's there's no market for that whatsoever. Just put it on an other pre-existing platform that people actually already are on uh, and stop wasting money that could go to funding real journalists journalism um, in that inane pursuit. So that would be my two cents on that whole issue. But uh, it sucks to be those reporters that were fired. I hope they are able to find employment elsewhere. Um, thank you also for the $10 super sticker. Uh, ben, ben Thune, really, really appreciate that. Um, and thank you also, Jenna, for the 199 Happy Thursday from Ohio. Friends, well, happy Thursday. Right back at you, Jenna. It's great. You're another corn commie, another Midwestern comrade joining our audience. So thank you so much for the super chat and for the kind greetings. Um, hope you're doing well. Yep. Uh, damn. What a fucking fast way to go through 90 minutes. Jesus Christ. But I think that's our show today. Uh, if Gavin and Zach had a baby, it would look like Kyle Kalinske. That's the, the that's horrifying to think about. I think it would look more like the baby from Eraserhead, but that's just my two cents. Uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. Really appreciate that. Huge shout out to the patrons. As always, the link is in the description. If you enjoy the content we create, it really, really, truly helps. Um, if you want to become a patron, again, it's a great way to support the show, to support independent leftist media. Uh, we're obviously being fucked by the algorithm, constantly demonetized, etc. I'm sure you guys know about all the struggles that you know people in our lane experience. Um, and it is very real. So again, we wouldn't be able to do the show without the patrons, without the contributors really helps us. So thank you so much. And the link is in the description. If you're not able to support the show financially, of course, that's more than understandable. Um, all we ask is that you hit that like button. Again, if you enjoyed the show, hit that like button and subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss our next live stream. We like to go live around 2 p.m., but you never know. A lot of times we mix it up. We'll go live around 1 p.m. or maybe 5 p.m. if we're feeling it that day. There really is no schedule here at the Vanguard. So again, hit that notification bell specifically so you definitely do not miss our next live stream. Uh, they're always a good time. We always love hanging with you guys. So again, thanks so much, guys. We really appreciate it and hope you have a great rest of your week.